I'm a midwife, uh, currently a midwifery lecturer, um, but it's still midwifery, midwife. Lovely. Uh, and what do you like about your job? I like working with women. I like being part of the journey that leads um, parents to a new family. So when I say working with women, mostly it's with women. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, it's with um, parents who are going to come to parenthood by surrogacy. So for example, a gay couple, something like that. So um, when I first came into midwifery, it was definitely more about working with women. That's for sure. Um, I'm very passionate about women's rights and particularly in maternity care. But, you know, we live in a, di a, di a diverse um, society now and it, it's much more, um, you're much more likely to see parents of, of different gen uh, gender realisations now, so. No, that's lovely. Um, and how did you get started? Um, well, a bit of a long journey, really. So um, when I left school, I went to university to study, study speech and language therapy. Um, and I, I didn't think it was exactly what I wanted to do, but I thought I probably wanted to do something allied to medicine without actually going down the route of being a doctor. Um, and I anyway, I went off and it was a Bachelor, bachelor of Medical Sciences. And one time or other, I was in the medical school looking at the journals. There was a whole load of journals out on the desk and there was a journal. It was actually um, British... Uh, Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and although it was a medical um, journal it, it was about birth and maternity and I was very interested and then when I took my first job he, um, my boss's wife was a community midwife and and it was just like when he said it it was like this whole light bulb moment that's what I want to do um, but at that point I was still you know, you know I just qualified doing something else I felt that having um, the state in those days paid grants and I'd like been paid to be trained as a speech and language therapist. And I felt I needed to give it back to society before I ran off and did something else. Then I started having a family that sort of slowed me down. And the, the other thing was that I knew, absolutely knew I didn't want to be a nurse. And originally I would have had to go through nursing. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was a change um, and you could become a direct entry midwife. And as soon as that was possible, it was just when am I going to do it? Not am I going to do it? Absolutely. So what would you say to anybody else starting out today? Um, I would say be very realistic. Um, it's a tough thing um, because the NHS is a tough working environment. So you have to be prepared to give a lot of yourself. Um, so, for example, you uh, you work shifts and you can't have much say in those shifts. So you get some, but not others. Um, people are busy, they're rushed, they're not always as kind as they can be. Um, truthfully, you know, an all-female environment is also not as kind as it can be. And all that sounds very negative, but the, the joy you get from working with families and planning care and um, being there at pivotal moments in somebody's life, and that's not always a new birth. Sometimes people lose their babies, so that's more about death but they're pivotal moments in people's lives and the honour of being there at that point outweighs everything else. But you do need to have a bit of a tough head about you. Yeah, I, I imagine you've, you've had to come quite far from going from like realising the joy in bringing a life in, but also having to learn how to handle uh, when the life hasn't could become basically, you know, to do with death. I mean, it's one of those people come to that realization in all sorts of different ways, Anya. But um, for me, it was when my mum died. So obviously, maternity and childbearing is about um, forming a, a, a mother type relationship, whether you call it a mother or whatever, but a mother type relationship. And, um, you know, I appreciated my mum a whole lot more when I was having the children. Mm -hmm. But it, when she died, that moment of her dying, there was like this thing of, okay. Well, what just happened there I mean one minute she's here one minute she's gone and it just became as clear to me as can be is that that sort of veil between life and death it's it's gossamer thin and just um when a baby's born it's not alive until it's separated from its mother and you know it's such it's a huge thing it's a huge thing that seemingly is just there in a second it's there in a second gone in a second and I just realized the two are just interwoven and mm. and it's almost like we're gatekeepers as midwives it's the best way I yeah, can describe I like it that. really 
Yeah, no, I re- I really like that saying. And you've worked obviously private and NHS, haven't you? Yeah. Am, I, yeah. am I right? Is there is there quite a difference in doing that? You have more autonomy. Have, very different. Well, you have more autonomy over your working life um, as a private midwife. So, for example, you're not on shifts. Um, I've always worked um, caseload holding, which means I've always looked after women through their antenatal, um, the birth and postnatally have looked after all of it. Um, and um, when you work for the NHS, they just tell you when you're going to work. Obviously, you've got to cover this shift. There's got to be the right skill mix. Um, and, I, and I did that caseloading in the NHS. But like I say, I had to be part of a bigger system. Mm. When you work independently, you work on your own or maybe with a partner and you can plan your diary. And when you do, um, when, when you have your appointments and when you see women, you share that between you, what suits you both. And the only time you can't choose is when the labour happens, yeah. you know. Yeah. But you kind of know it's going to happen. And also, you know, the women so well that you really have a sense of when that birth is going to be. They don't um, take you for granted. They don't ring you with lots of false calls or anything like that. You just know each other so well that when the labour comes, you kind of know it's coming, you know. Do you get do you get nervous at all even when the, when when you know labor's happening now or is it is it just protocol for you now? No, you should never take it for granted. I think if you go in there with this um, let's say fair type attitude, um, you're not you're not being watchful enough. Mm. And and looking after somebody in labor is all about being watchful and listening and smelling and and paying attention. And if you kind of think, oh, yeah, well, everything's going to be all right, you won't pay attention in the right way. So nervous is not the right word, but you are tuned in, yeah, highly tuned in. Yeah, I like that. And my final question, I was just going to ask, obviously, like you were mentioning before that, um, you know, we have come quite far in the fact that like gay couples and uh, adopting and stuff has become a lot farther. Have, has it been quite a big thing throughout like your journey? of and career within midwifery has it become a lot a, a, a much more supported thing and I'm guessing you've seen a lot more children actually going into homes than necessarily maybe going into care and foster I don't know if that is a thing um I think you're asking me two separate things there maybe so the um the the gender identification is more open than it was yeah. um so I think we've got we've got several things uh, I mean, lesbian couples, I don't think used to particularly come out and admit their sexuality. Mm. Um, you know, there'd be a mother, but perhaps there'd just be a friend with a, you know, and kind of we all knew, but we didn't really say anything. But that's way gone. Um, it, it's I don't think it's very easy for gay couples to find surrogates, but certainly I have worked with surrogates. Um, and that's, as I say, it's not taboo in any shape or form. Um, the uh, parents that would identify themselves as non-binary, um, relatively new in sort of the last part of my career, that became more of a thing. And then you're talking more around um, the language of gender as well. So, you know, you really, uh, it's not just what you think about something, it's how you address people, how you talk to people. These things are very important when you're forming new families. Um, and of course, now we've got, um, trans as well where some people are on the journey to changing their body but they have um they have retained their female reproductive org- organs so that they can have the family before they fully undergo a final change so we're meeting every type of family um you can imagine in terms of foster care and carer that's a different subject altogether that's around um people's ability to parent and that's mm. usually around issues to do with safeguarding you know will, will the child be safe in the care of that particular parent but it's got now to do with gender right yeah absolutely cool. no I, I imagine that's the the tougher side of the job you have to do. well not everybody is able to be a parent you know anybody can reproduce if if they are physically able to reproduce but not everybody is able to be a parent for some people life hasn't been kind to them their lives are chaotic um, you know, they may um, have an addiction of one sort or another. They may support themselves through um, work that is inherently unsafe around children, if you see what I mean. Um, so, no, not everybody has 
the ability to parent in the moment they have a baby. Um, sometimes children are taken into care, but they may be returned to the parent at some point, or they may not, or that parent may go on to um, perhaps um, have a lifestyle that would support parenting in a family. So they might go on to um, have a family at a later time as well. So, I mean, families are made in all sorts of different ways. That is what I would say to you.